All right, you can turn in your Bible to the book of Galatians. This week we're going to be looking at the book of Galatians for scriptures that show that the catching away of the bride of Christ will happen before Daniel's 70th week or the time of Jacob's trouble. But I titled the sermon, Preacher Rapture Scriptures in Galatians, because that's what most people understand. They understand the pre-tribulation rapture. Um, of course, that's not a Bible term, obviously. Uh, the tribulation, as I've said many times before, but I say it for new viewers, the tribulation as a title for the coming seven-year period appears not one time in the King James Bible. Nowhere does it appear that way. And, of course, there's a lot of deception involved with why these post-tribbers mostly are calling it the tribulation. Um, and I've talked about that in other studies. You know, the, the thing that you have to understand, uh, this whole rapture debate issue, it's not, the, the rapture is major doctrine. It is uh, very extremely important. It's tied in with your salvation. It is, it is actually the completion of your salvation. We're going to see that today. Again, another scripture that ties in with other ones that we've gone over in previous studies. It's very, very, very important. Extremely important doctrine of the Bible. And being a major doctrine, it's not going to be something that you can get in just a five-minute quick little video with nice special effects and whatever, music, you know, or something like that. Fancy graphics and animation. Uh, that isn't going to work. Okay, um, the Bible says in the end times that people would depart from the faith, that there would be, you know, they will not endure sound doctrine, you know. That's what a lot of people do. And I know that I see so many comments in these in the comment sections of these videos I've been doing, proving the pre-tribulation rapture, I see so many comments of people, by their comment, I know that they're not watching the whole study. They're not watching the whole video. You know, and they're not considering the arguments. And they, they'll come out with a bunch more and they'll say, why this and why that? Watch my other studies. You know, I mean, if you really, really want the truth, spend some time, watch the studies. Okay. But let's get started. Okay, one other statement I want to make here before we get into the actual scriptures. A uh, thing that you're going to hear is they'll say, there are no clear scriptures that prove a pre-trib rapture, and that they have to go here and pick this and pick that and pick this. And Okay, um, what they're saying is that there's no clear scripture saying the words pre-trib rapture. And they're saying that while defending something called the post-trib rapture, which there's no scripture for that either that uses that exact title. It's kind of funny. You know, they'll attack you for something, but they themselves turn right around and do the same thing, but according to their beliefs. It's kind of weird. But you see, the whole thing with this study is when you understand basic concepts for right now for the body of Christ, again, you have to be dispensational or the pre-trib rapture, you're just not going to understand it. If you refuse to rightly divide the word of truth as you are commanded to do in 2 Timothy 2.15, if you refuse to rightly divide the word of truth, you're going to be going to Matthew, you're going to be going to Mark, you're going to be going to Luke, you're going to be going back to the Old Testament, back to the book of Revelation. You're going to be jumping all over the place. You know, you have to rightly divide the word of truth. And when you compare doctrines in the Pauline epistles, you'll see there's something called eternal security. Okay? You are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise until the day of redemption, according to the book of Ephesians, which we'll be looking at in the next study when we hit the book of Ephesians. But you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise until the day of redemption. You cannot lose your salvation when you are truly, genuinely saved, when you are really born again. And when I say that, that you're not a false convert. You know, that's why I have to say that. I have to preface that. Okay? A lot of people are false converts. That's why they're living in all kinds of wicked sin and, and thinking that they're saved. And going around saying, I've, I believe in eternal security. Uh, well, <laughs> if you get saved, then yes. But uh, false converts don't have eternal security. But once you understand the concept of eternal security, then you realize, okay, right now, we as Christians have eternal security, but in the time of Jacob's trouble, they aren't going to have it because they can take the mark. Anybody who takes the mark goes to hell. See? So whenever you see something in the Pauline epistles that lines up with eternal security, you know, okay, that's for me, but it's not for somebody that goes into the time of Jacob's trouble. See? Very basic. Very basic. Um, Paul warns about certain things that can really mess you up, but he never once in the Pauline epistles, Paul never warns about, you know, written to us. I do believe Paul wrote Hebrews. I'll, let me say that. 
Paul never once warns any believer in Corinth or the Romans or Galatia or Ephesus or any of them. He never warns them about not taking the mark. He provides no future warning for anybody to not take the mark. You see? Again, comparing Scripture with Scripture. But now we're going to start out here, okay? Galatians chapter 1. We're going to see if there are some Scriptures that, again, point to the catching away of the bride of Christ before the time of Jacob's trouble. There's some good ones in this. Starting out, Galatians chapter 1, verse 3. Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember last week, if you saw the 2 Corinthians 1, peace, God gives you peace. Verse 4, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Okay? You say, well, okay, but okay, deliver us from this present evil world. That's talking about as far as sin is concerned. Uh, well, in a certain sense, yes. You see, because our sins are not imputed to us. If you sin now, you're going to be punished, but you'll be punished as a child not as a lost person. Okay, your sin is not put on your record anymore because your sins were put on Jesus Christ when he died on the cross. His righteousness is imputed to you. You can read about that in the book of Romans. But the point is, that's not what this verse is talking about. Look at it. Who gave himself for our sins, there we go, that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. Well, wouldn't it be according to God's will for you to be delivered from sinning? Not messing around with sin? Well, sure. Why would it say then according to the will of God and our Father? That should just be kind of an automatic thing that we don't mess around with sin anymore, right? Yeah. What's it talking about? Well, who is it that knows the timing of the rapture? God. The Lord knows. We don't know. We have no idea. But you see, when it's His will for us to leave, we're going to be delivered from this present evil world. And how many people are looking forward to that? <laughs> I'll raise my hand there. I'd raise both hands, but I'd drop my Bible, you know. I'm sure a lot of you out there are looking forward to being delivered from this present evil world as well. I just talk about vexation. You know, you can relate to the book of, uh, I think it's Second uh, Peter, I think, where it talks about Lot. You know, how God delivered just Lot, being vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked, you know, day by day there, you know. Yeah, it's very vexing to live in this world. It's just quite disgusting. And uh, if you remember the Romans study, we'll go over the scripture one more time. Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13, verse 11 says, And that knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. You know, you want to talk about a great scripture to prove that we get raptured out before the time of Jacob's trouble. Right there it is. Our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. You say, what do you, huh? I thought you get salvation when you believe. Well, yeah, you do. But it's not 100% complete salvation. So what, what are you talking about? 100% complete salvation is when all three parts of us are redeemed. Okay? When you are a lost person, you have three parts to you. We are made in the image of God. We have a body, we have a soul, we have a spirit. Alright? Your spirit is dead in trespasses and sins. Your soul is headed to hell. Your flesh is corruptible. Your flesh is prone to sin. Your flesh is what causes you to sin. All right? When you get saved, that spirit is quickened. We read about that in Ephesians chapter 1. Your spirit is made alive. It's kind of like the old analogy. You have a remote control, and it has all the capabilities of controlling that camera right there. But if it doesn't have any batteries in it, or if the batteries are dead, it isn't going to do anything to control that camera. When the Holy Spirit comes into the life of a Christian, it's like batteries, okay, coming into this remote control. All of a sudden, the things that weren't being turned on and didn't work before, now they work. See? So you get saved, the Holy Spirit comes in, your spirit is quickened, your soul is redeemed, but guess what? Your flesh is still lost. So what are you, what are you talking about? Our flesh is corruptible. Read Romans chapter 7 sometime where... 
uh, Paul says, I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. And he's going, O wretched man that I am, you know, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? See? What's going on there? Who shall deliver me? I mean, why don't we why don't we just go over there to that scripture? Romans chapter seven. I'll show you. Romans chapter seven, verse twenty four. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Galatians chapter one, verse four, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. Right there it is. You know what one of the most amazing things is going to be? Go back to the book of Galatians there. One of the most amazing things when the rapture happens is all of a sudden being in an incorruptible body in a moment in the twinkling of an eye like that. And all of a sudden there's no more lust. There's no more greed. There's no more wrath, hatred, emulation, strife. There's no more of it. It's done. Finished. And we're going to get up there and you're going to meet all the people that you've had contentions with, you know, those that are truly saved. We're all going to get up there and there ain't going to be any, <clears throat> yeah, brother, you know, I'm glad you're here, but, you know, I, I don't think I really want to fellowship with you because, you know, I disagree with you on this subject and that, you know, that's not going to be there. We're all going to be straightened out doctrinally. We will be delivered from this present evil world and our flesh. Our bodies are going to be incorruptible. We will have the mind of Christ. According to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, talks about that. We will know even as we are also known. So not only are we not going to feel pain anymore, we're not going to be tempted to sin. <laughs> you know, oh boy, wouldn't that be nice? Yes, it certainly will be. Uh, go to Ephesians, keep your hand there in, in Galatians chapter 1, but go to Ephesians chapter 1, verses 12 through 14, which we're going to be t talking about this next week. Ephesians 1, verse 12 through 14, that we should be to the praise of His glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of His glory. That is when we will be delivered from this present evil world. When we're caught up. Yeah, it's going to be a good time. Next we're going to go to, jump down to verse 6 through 9. Galatians chapter 1 verses 6 through 9. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed." Okay, so Paul's saying, hey, this is the gospel here. We have preached this gospel. Don't let anybody else preach it unless it's, you know, though we or an angel preaches it. Is there a time when an angel preaches a gospel? Yes. Turn in your Bible to Revelation chapter 14. see about this angel preaching this gospel. Revelation 14, verse 6. Read down to verse 12. It says here, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. God's such a racist, you know, looking at the different people there, you know, and everything. Making distinction between peoples. Oh, so terrible. Uh, verse 7, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, 
for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Okay, there's a new thing here going on uh, where you have to fear God on a level that we don't know anything about here in the church age. This time period, the time of Jacob's trouble, there's a brand new system there. There is still faith in Jesus, that's true. But now there's a new thing where if you take the mark, you go to hell. And there's all these post-tribbers. They cannot handle, this is the main thing, they cannot handle this. They'll try to come up with something. Uh, Stephen Anderson came up with this thing of the Antichrist is going to have brain scanners and Christians will come in to take the mark and he'll go, oh, wait, it's a Christian. Cut their head off. They won't be allowed to take the mark. Now, why would the Antichrist do a thing like that? I mean, wouldn't that be awfully stupid? You cut the Christian's head off, they die as a martyr, they get rewarded. Duh. I mean, the Antichrist can read the Bible. He knows what the Bible says. But if a Christian comes in, the Antichrist sees him coming in and... and he brain scans them and he goes, wait, it's a Christian. Let them take the mark, man. They'll go to hell. Let's re keep reading. Let's see about this. Verse 8. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, uh, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the third angel followed them saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Notice in verse 9 it says, If any man... I've talked about this many times, but some people just don't get it through the old thick skull there. Okay? It's if any man, not, you know, well, a Christian that takes it would maybe they could get. No, it says any man that takes it gets God's wrath. And by the way, that wrath starts when the mark is given at the beginning of the time of Jacob's trouble. So don't fall for that either. You know, I'm post trib pre wrath. Nonsense. The wrath of God's all through the thing. All right. I mean, God, you know, brings the nations together. You read about it back in the book of Zephaniah. He, he brings them together to pour out his fierce indignation upon them. What do you think that is? It's wrath. So don't fall for that lie either. It's another post-trib heretic little lie that they come out with. But you see it there. You take that mark. If anybody takes the mark, they go to hell. And you say, yeah, but you see, there's three different things there. Um, if any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark. See, that's three different things. So maybe you could do two out of three and still get away with it, or maybe a third of it. Or... Nonsense, okay? It's all going to be, all three of those things are going to happen at the same time, all right? You're probably going to go into the pharmacy or wherever they're going to be implementing the mark of the, the beast thing. You go there for flu shots now, so why not? You know, but uh, maybe military checkpoint or I don't know, wherever it's going to be. And you're going to go in there and you're going to get your implantable microchip in your right hand or in your forehead, maybe a visible mark also upon the forehead at some kind of tattoo or QR code or some kind of deal. Not really sure at this point. They're coming up with so many different technologies. Anything could be it. But we're not going to see it, by the way, as Christians. We'll be out of here before the Antichrist is even revealed. See my other studies if you want the proof. But what's going to happen is it's going to be all one system. You're going to swear to you know, worship the beast and whatever else. I hereby do swear, you know, okay, put the mark in you. It's going to be one system. It isn't going to be that you can do a third of it and still be saved or two thirds and still be saved or whatever. No. And any preacher out there, be they John MacArthur or Kent Hovind or any of them that says, I think that you could probably take the mark and still be okay. Man, don't listen to them. Do not listen to them. They are lying to you. All right. But look at verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Two different things. you got to keep the commandments of God. Why? Because verse 7 said, Fear God and give glory to Him. Fearing God takes on a whole new level now. And you got to keep His commandments. What are His commandments? Well, if you read back in Matthew chapter 24, which all the post-tribbers like to go to, if you read back in Matthew 20, chapter 24, it says about... Pray that your, night, your, your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. 
And I did a study on that. The Sabbath day is given for a sign to the Jewish people. And the signs, the Jews require a sign, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. You see, it all lines up, all right? Unless you're post-trip. Then you make a mess of the Bible to try and prove your point, which is ridiculous. But you see there, Paul says, though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel. An angel just preached another gospel. And see, all these post-trib heretics are already working on people trying to get them to say, it's grace by grace through faith. From now to eternity, it's always been by grace through faith, even before Jesus died on the cross. They were believing in Jesus before Jesus died on the cross. Weird because his disciples, his own disciples, when Jesus is saying, I'm signifying what death I'm going to die, they're going, be it far from thee, Lord. What? You know, huh? And even after he dies on the cross, he explains that he's going to die on the cross. And even after that, he comes up from the dead and he's walking around with them and stuff. And they're going, we thought that he was the one that should come. They still didn't believe it. <laughs> so don't fall for this lie. And I've talked about this before. Don't fall for the lie that they were saved in the Old Testament the same way we're saved today. It's always been by grace through faith. Uh, no, it hasn't. So an angel preaches another gospel. It's not accursed. But ironically, if you go back to Galatians chapter 1, ironically, all these uh, post-trib heretics that are coming out and saying, you know, uh, well, I, you know, I used to be pre-trib. And I just started to study the Bible without the commentaries. You know, I, I put down my commentaries and I put down my other books and things and I just read the Word of God for myself and I prayed and, you know, I had to give up my pre-trib rapture beliefs and I had to return to the historic position of the church and, you know, and now I'm post-trib, pre-wrath or mid-trib, uh, post-wrath, pre-sun uh, uh, darkened and, and post-angel fallen from heaven and uh, pre-locust, but um, um, we go before the locust, but before the, you know... <laughs> They come out with all kinds of stupid nonsense. We're here for this, but not for that. And we're go, we go through part of it, but you know, no, actually, we don't go through any of it. Why? Because the body of Christ has had their time of being persecuted. And, they, and you know, again, a lot of these guys are false converts that are coming out and saying, I think the body of Christ is going through it. You know? Well, you, you, you will be, you know. There goes something on the floor. Knocked my notes down. But, uh, you know, they probably will be going through it, you know. So sad for them. But you see, they do this thing there and they'll say, you're not to have this other gospel. Dispensationalism is another gospel. Well, if it, it would be if we were preaching it for right now. Okay. But what is going on here, Paul is saying, hey, if anybody's preaching another gospel right now, the we or an angel preaches it. Paul says, I'm not changing it, but there will come an angel someday. He's prophesying what happens in the future. Yeah, an angel does preach it, and it is a different gospel, slightly different than what we have. Right? It's still believing in Jesus. It's still faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. It's still that he died for your sins. That's true, but now you can't take the mark, which causes all kinds of contradictions between the Pauline epistles and what's going on in Revelation. Paul says, If any man provide not for his own, especially they for his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. 1 Timothy chapter 5. But yet in the time of Jacob's trouble, book of Revelation, Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 17 and 21, in that time, if you are providing for your own by taking the mark, you won't be able to buy or sell if you don't have it, you know. If you're doing that, you go to hell. How do you reconcile that stuff? You can't. That's called rightly dividing. It's not, I ignore this part of Scripture. No, it's called, I am rightly dividing it. These people, they don't understand that. But uh, ironically, it's kind of funny because when they are saying, well, it's the, the gospel that we have today is the same one that's preached in Revelation. You know what they're doing? They are actually preaching a false gospel because they're accusing us of preaching other gospels for today, yet they themselves are doing it. Isn't that interesting? If the gospel of Revelation 14 is the same gospel that we have today, then brethren, you can take the mark. How about that? And little Brian Moonan comes out and he does this little video about me being a hyper-dispensationalist, which is so funny because I'm not. A hyper-dispensationalist is somebody that actually separates the body of Christ into two different parts. But, um, so the guy's ignorant. But, uh, you know, 
big surprise. But, you know, the point is, he comes out and he says, Revelation 14, that gospel there is for us. But he doesn't read down through verses 9 through 12. He stops before he gets to there. So if he's preaching that, he's accursed, according to our text. The gospel of the tribulation, of the, of the time of Jacob's trouble, Daniel's 70th week, that gospel is our gospel. Then you're accursed and on your way to hell. And it's so funny, too. I've heard these guys, and they'll say, you know, they'll, they'll come to Matthew 24, 13, and they'll go, well, it says, He that shall endure in the end, the same shall be saved. And, and in context, too, by the way, it's talking about the gospel that's preached. It's not that you have to endure to physically be saved. No, it's talking about spiritual salvation. And again, they'll try to duck that now, too. I've seen that. A lot of people, Rick Jacoby, you know, and, it's, and some of these others, they're, they're claiming this now. So many false prophets, it's just incredible. But, what is going on there is they'll say Matthew 24, 13 is for us. We're going to have to endure to the end to be saved. And, you know, Revelation 14, you know, there that's our gospel too. They are literally cursing themselves. They are cursed. Be very careful who you're listening to. If they're non-dispensational, first of all, they need to be preaching out of the King James Bible. That gets rid of John MacArthur. If they're non-dispensational, that gets rid of Stephen Anderson, Ken Hovind, Brian Moonan, a um, whole bunch of them. If they're non-dispensational, don't listen to them. Mike Hoggard, another one. He's non-dispensational. And these, these, all of them have had a chance to repent too, by the way. It's not that they're just ignorant and they don't know. They're openly rejecting dispensational teaching and saying, I will never be dispensational. I've had dealings with nearly all of them, guys. Galatians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. We're going to see another uh, scripture here. Galatians 3, 1 through 3. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth crucified among you? This only would I learn of you. Receive ye the Spirit by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? Are ye so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? Is that true for us today? Yeah. You're not going to be made perfect by the flesh. Your flesh, you know, in terms of sanctification, yes, you do have to do things to clean up things with your flesh and try to, try to fight against your desires to sin and things like that. But if you royally mess up, all that's going to happen to you, you're not going to lose your salvation. You're just, you're probably going to lose your life. You know, God's going to have to punish you. He's going to have to chastise you. That's going to be there. All right. But what's going on here? What about that in the time of Jacob's trouble? You begin in the spirit, but guess what? Your flesh is going to be fighting mightily in that time period. Let me show you. Keep your hand there in Galatians chapter 3. And head back to Jeremiah chapter 30. I'll show you what I'm talking about here. You say, I don't understand what the, you know, being made perfect by the flesh thing. Just bear with me for a minute here. Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 4. Start there. And these are the words that the Lord spake concerning Israel and concerning Judah. Any confusion who this is to? For thus saith the Lord, we have heard a voice of trembling, of fear, and not of peace. And yet our study from last week in 2 Corinthians and our study here began out with God giving you peace. But they don't have peace for the time of Jacob's trouble. But look at verse 6. Ask ye now and see whether a man doth travail with child. Wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his loins as a woman in travail, and all faces are turned into paleness? Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. Hmm. Go back to Galatians. So you have a man, and he's going like this. And his face is pale. What's happening? He's starving. Why is he starving? Because he can't buy food. You can't buy food unless you take the mark of the beast. That's what's going on there. So, your flesh is going to be involved in your salvation in the time of Jacob's trouble. You see? I'm not worried about uh, having to go to the store right now and use a debit card or some other kind of a, 
electronic form of payment or something like that to get food. I'm not going to lose my salvation for doing it. But you will in the time of Jacob's trouble. So you will begin in the Spirit. You have to have faith in Jesus Christ. If you remember Romans or Revelation chapter 14, verse 12, the faith of Jesus, and you keep the commandments. So they do begin in the Spirit, but they also have to be there with the flesh as well. It's going to be a real difficult thing. But let's continue. Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. says, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. I've been over this thing many times, but I'm going to say it just another time here, again for new viewers, and that is, this is true for today. Okay? Right now, spiritually speaking, we're all one in Christ Jesus. Okay? Now, that doesn't mean that there's no distinction there. All right? That doesn't mean you say, there's neither Jew nor Greeks, God doesn't have any racial prejudices. You know, uh, God doesn't see differences between different nations, peoples, ethnicities. Right? I don't like to use the word race because it's not a Bible word. But let's just say nations, peoples, tongues, kindreds. God doesn't see any distinction. Uh, that's not what that verse is saying. You say, how do you know that? There is neither male nor female. Uh, yes, there is. And God has different rules for both. So you see... There is a difference between Jews and Greeks. There is a difference between bond and free. There is a difference between male and female. But spiritually, right now, we're all one. And yet if you go to Revelation chapter 7, into the time of Jacob's trouble, there's 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes that are sealed. They're the ones that get sealed. In their forehead, they don't take a mark, but God seals them in their forehead. Satan counterfeits it with the mark of the beast. They're sealed in their forehead. 144,000 chosen Jews. And then there's a great multitude that gets saved after that in Revelation chapter 7, after it's described 12,000 from each of those 12 tribes. So they're not one in Christ Jesus in that time. And they wash their own robes, by the way, in the blood of the Lamb. Why? They begin in the Spirit, but they're made perfect by the flesh. You see? It doesn't line up. You can't take Galatians and slap it down on a tribulation saint. You can't do it. The rules are different. Things don't work out. If you don't rightly divide the word of truth, you're going to make a mess of this stuff. And you're going to have to go to Greek to try and change the text of the King James Bible, or you're going to have to just, just try and lie your way through the thing. It doesn't work. Let's continue. Galatians chapter 4, verses 9 through 11. It says here, But now, after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage? Ye observe days and months and times and years. I am afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. What was going on there in Galatia is these Christians were going back under Old Testament Judaism type of laws and things like that. And you say, well, what is this? how does this prove a pre-trib rapture? This doesn't make any sense. Well, again, compare it with the people that are going to be in the time of Jacob's trouble. Will they be observing uh, days and months and times and years? The Bible says, like I said earlier, you know, that your pray that your flight be not in the uh, winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Uh, yes, they are actually going to be observing the, do the Sabbath days. So why would Paul write that for believers in the body of Christ if the body of Christ is going to go into the time and have to observe those days? Huh? Doesn't work. Again, it doesn't work. And do you think that they're not going to be observing their uh, months, times, and years? <laughs> uh, yeah, I think that they're going to be very interested in how many years they have to go yet. You know, Oh, yeah, just a little bit, you know, definitely. <laughs> um, but we don't have to worry about that, you see. Paul's saying, I'm afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. Don't waste your time, Christian. Don't waste your time trying to set dates and, you know, wait a second. 2016, I saw a Hollywood movie and it said that June the 6th of 2016, 616, 
that could mean, and if there's a two and you take the two plus one and, and then that's three plus two or times two is six, 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 six. So June is, please, okay, don't waste your time with observing days, months, times, and years trying to figure out when the Lord's going to catch us out of here. Your job as a Christian is to look for his appearing, love his appearing. It says back in First uh, Timothy, I think it is, you know, love his appearing and get out there and witness to the lost. Okay, we are ministers of reconciliation, ambassadors of the gospel. That's what we're supposed to do. We're not supposed to be going, okay, time, you know, what day, month, time and year? Hmm, I think that this is going to be the year. We don't know when the year is going to be. We have no idea. I hope that this is the year, but I can't tell you that this is the year, right? All I can tell you to do is stay active for the Lord. You know, stay strong in your faith. But let's continue. Galatians chapter 4, verse 30. Talking about here, um, verse 22 down through 31, it's talking about the difference between Ishmael and Isaac how that uh, one of them was born by a bond woman, the other by a free woman. Look at verse 30. Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bond woman and her son, for the son of the bond woman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. But God makes no distinctions between people being in the bounds of their habitation. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 8, where it talks about how that God has set the bounds of the nations according to the number of the children of Israel, and then I think the next verse talks about Israel is the lot of his inheritance. That's done away, apparently, according to the integrationist believers out there, that God's all done with that. And they say, oh, there's no clear New Testament scriptures. Acts chapter 17, verse 26. God set the bounds of their habitation. It's still here for today. And the Lord's there going, that land of Israel belongs to the Jews. Well, I think the Jews are black people. No, it's Jews from Shem. I think the Jews are white people that live in Arizona. No, it's Jews from Shem. And people seem to forget one thing. Well, what about this verse over here? What about this verse over there? What about this? It says Jesus' feet are like burnished brass. And this one over here says that this guy and this, and they, they mistook you know, Paul for an Egyptian. And what about, it's a geographic prophecy. And I've been saying this for a long time to all these replacement theology heretics, all the Hebrew ruts, Hebrew root nuts, <laughs> Hebrew ruts, that might work. You know, all these people, I've been saying the same thing. If you're a Jew, if you're the true Jew, you're the true Israel, whatever else, then you got a piece of land that belongs to you. And it's not spiritual. It is a physical piece of real estate where you're supposed to be at. Okay. All the Jews, people that are over there, they're Khazarians, they're, they're, they're of, you know, Ashkenaz, and they're blah, 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 blah. Okay, they're in the land, and they speak the language of Hebrew. They're fulfilling the prophecy. Why? Because they're the Jews. Okay? <laughs> yeah, I know that's very difficult for some people to understand, apparently. You know, but just, just try. All right. Right now, the comments, the keys are being hit. I don't like your attitude. Well, you're going to like it a lot less as time goes by. But, you know, when you see on verse 30 again, when you see this whole thing, the conflict in the Middle East and the Palestinians and how dare these Jews take the Palestinians lands, there's not one Palestinian that has a right to that land. Okay. And when I talk about supporting Israel, I'm not saying I support their sin. I support their rejection of Jesus Christ as their Messiah. I support whatever. No, no, no. I support their right to that land. Because it is in that land that Jesus Christ is going to return them. And will not return them. He's going to bring them to salvation. Romans chapter 11. And that's their, that's their land over there that they're going to have in the millennial kingdom. Where Jesus Christ is going to rule and reign in Jerusalem. So, don't fall for this propaganda of replacement theology and whatever else. Don't fall for it, okay? It's the land. That's the key to the thing. Those people that are over there are the rightful inhabitants, and God brought them there. And God will use the wicked to 
accomplish his ways. Look what he did with Nebuchadnezzar. So don't tell me, oh, the Rothschilds brought him. Okay, who's worse, the Rothschilds or Nebuchadnezzar? Who's more powerful? God used Nebuchadnezzar. Don't tell me he didn't use the Rothschilds and Zionism and whatever else to bring those Jews back to the land so if prophecy could be fulfilled exactly as the Bible said it would be fulfilled. Not because a bunch of black Africans in New York City are calling themselves the Jews living in Harlem or a bunch of stupid white you know, supremacists down in Arizona or wherever else are calling themselves the Jews. I think the fulfillment of any prophecy except for Revelation 2, verse 9, and 3, verse 9. Look that up if you have time, if you don't know what I'm talking about. All right, next we're going to go to Galatians 5, 19 through 21. It says here, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, uh, hatred, Variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I have told, uh, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Wait a second. We're going to have to read that again because I did not see anything about taking the mark of the beast, because certainly that would be a work of the flesh that would keep you from inheriting the kingdom of God. I mean, if we're, you know, since the body of Christ, quote unquote, is going to be going into the time of Jacob's trouble, into the great tribulation, since we're going to be going into it, Paul definitely would have warned us about the mark of the beast. That definitely would have been a work of the flesh. So let me just look here. Um, oh, wait a second. Uh, let me get out the, uh, the Greek text here. Uh, let's see, you know. Oh, uh, no. Not in there. Um, hmm. Uh, you know what? I don't think it's in there. You know why? Because the body of Christ isn't going into the time of Jacob's trouble, and we don't have to worry about taking the mark of the beast. Okay? Do you get it? Has it entered in up here? I hope so. Next, we're going to go to Galatians chapter 6. It's going to be where we're going to end. Galatians chapter 6, verse 15. It says here, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. Well, that's true for us, but it's not true for the time of Jacob's trouble. Um, do you think it's going to avail you something if you're one of the 144,000 Jews that's sealed? Yes. If you're hand-picked, hand-chosen by God, one of those 144,000 Jews in Revelation chapter 7, um, it will certainly, your circumcision there, which is what this is talking about, Jews versus Gentiles, your circumcision is going to definitely avail you. It's going to give you a distinct benefit, in other words. It's going to be a great thing. So, if you're trying to make Galatians fit into Revelation... It's all for the same people. It doesn't work. Right now, in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. I quote that verse till people get sick and tired of me quoting it, <laughs> but I don't care. I'm going to keep quoting it. You know why? Because that's the beauty of the gospel for right now. Right now, when you get saved, you become a new creature in Christ Jesus. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter who you are, what uh, family you've come from, or, or your financial status, or anything. It doesn't matter how bad you've been. You can become a new creature in Christ Jesus. You just come to Him broken. You say, well, I'm not that bad of a person. Okay, then you're not ready for salvation. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. He didn't come for you if you're not a sinner. If you're not a bad person. Jesus said, I'm not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Right now, 
No matter what your life situation is, you can get saved today. It's that simple. And your only qualification is you have to be a sinner and know that you're a sinner. That's it. You come to Him in faith. Watch our gospel message. It takes you through the, all the scriptures. I'm not going to go into them all here. Because you see, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You want to make sure that your salvation is based on this book. Okay? That's why I say watch the gospel message. It's not that you have to pay, you know, $19.99, you know, or something like this. You know, it's a pay-per-view type of a deal. No, 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 no. Absolutely free. But I'm saying it'll show you the scriptures to make sure that you're saved. Because if you miss it, if you don't get saved soon and you go into that time of Jacob's trouble, you're going to have a really difficult time. I'm doing this to try and spare you from that time. Very, very, very important. All right? So let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, if there's somebody out there who's lost, I pray that they would think about what has been said in this study, that they would seriously consider salvation, that they would uh, watch the gospel message and, and look at the scriptures and, and uh, just put everything else aside. There's nothing in this life that's more important than salvation. And Lord, I'd, I'd pray for the Christians out there that they would not be swayed by the lies of the post-trib heretics, but that they would stand fast and unmovable and uh, not let their faith be destroyed in you, Lord. That's, that's the whole thing. You said in your word that, that you are the resurrection and the life. And, um, and we know that, Lord, at the rapture, that's going to be the resurrection. And uh, that's the time when we're going to be out of here and we're going to say goodbye to this wicked world. You will deliver us from this present evil world. And we pray, Lord, that that would be soon because I know I'm looking forward to it. I know others are as well. And I just pray, Lord, that you would help us all to be diligent about working for you getting things done in the time that we have. And I pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Uh, that's going to be it for the pre-trib rapture study in the book of Galatians. Going to be doing Ephesians next. And uh, some uh, continuing uh, projects that we're going to be coming out with. Some very interesting things. Um, not going to give too many hints away, but uh, some really hardcore stuff. Um, I don't think people realize how much time we spend in research. And I say that just simply because uh, I wish I could bring out more things. I wish I could be a lot more, um, just coming out with a lot more stuff. But uh, between obligations, just worldly stuff, going for groceries, you know, and plowing snow and, you know, just to keep our lane open, which is not a very big lane, but it's, you get a lot of snow here in, in this area, you know. Between that and research, there's a lot going on. So um, please, please, please keep us in your prayers. Um, and uh, those that donate to the ministry, we do thank you so much for that. It keeps us going. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's something that we've always provided our videos for free. Uh, DVDs, I used to sell DVDs simply because it cost me something to make them, you know, and... and uh, you know, I don't do that anymore because I'm trying really, really hard to focus on just free video. Get them out there, post them on your channel, uh, mirror them on your, you know, channel on YouTube. Uh, we are very blessed to see that happening. And um, uh, just really, God's really doing some amazing things here in these end times. Uh, a lot of people are waking up because it's get, just getting so bad. And... Uh, this world is getting very, very evil. And the time of our deliverance from that um, and God making that decision, I believe it's rapidly approaching. So until then, uh, stay true to God's Word, King James Bible. Stay true to it. And um, be diligent about witnessing to people. Don't get discouraged. And above all, do not listen to the lies of the post rivers. Uh, don't feel that they, you know, a lot of times they'll say, well, you know, you need to listen to us and things. They're presenting a false gospel, okay? Those that are really hardcore into the whole thing. If you have a novice that's just kind of ignorant on the whole issue, you know, they're going to be just a little bit confused and things. But you get the ones that are actually really hardcore teaching a post-trib rapture, uh, they're preaching a false gospel. 
They're preaching another gospel, telling you that Revelation 14 is the same gospel that we have today. That is a lie. They're accursed. So that's why I call them heretics. Stay away from them. That is going to be it. Thank you very much for watching.